I'm Corey, and this is the Hardcore Skeptic Examines. All right, so things are going pretty well for the show. I've put out four interviews so far and had some great positive feedback. I've gotten a bit of flack too, but mostly it's been good. It's been suggested that I change the format of the show so that I'm not checking on what people say after the fact and then arguing with them without giving them the chance to defend themselves. And that seems fair. I'm considering what my options are. I've got a couple ideas. The unfortunate thing is that I did these interviews with an idea of how to mix different segments together for a very long format show and contrast opinions. So I slammed out a bunch of interviews whenever I had a spare moment over March and April. And I would have liked to have fact checked things people said in the moment or make arguments about what they were saying one way or the other, but that's not what the project was originally meant to be. Still, I understand the concern. And as a result, I've decided to change the method of fact checking and commentary It's going to take a bit longer between episodes, so I'm not sure I'll be able to keep the week-to-week schedule, but I will put out an episode as soon as, each episode as soon as it's ready. I hope that you enjoy the new format and method of doing things. Before I move on, I just want to mention that in my post-interview commentary in the last episode, I mentioned that I didn't have time to dig deeper and find all the appropriate links for everything. I have since found references for nearly everything that Edwin said and that he hadn't already supplied and posted those links in the show notes for episode four. I realized that less people check the show notes than maybe I'm intending to, but the references are there supporting the things that he said if you want them. So that's all the pre-interview housekeeping to do. This is episode five. This is the fifth episode in the Social Justice series, and in this one I interviewed Sincere Carabo. Sincere is the Social Justice Coordinator for the American Humanist Association and has written a few articles for websites like Huffington Post, Everyday Feminism, and The Establishment. It was, I think, an informative and enjoyable interview. He approaches the subject in a slightly different manner than I'm used to. More, well, you'll hear it. (laughs) It was very insightful. And very educational. And I think that it it adds a perspective that can help people understand what social justice is about and why it's in, import, why it is important in the context of humanism. So with that said, here's my interview with Sincere Carabo. I hope you enjoy it. Let's start off with... Who are you and what is your background? My name is Sincere Carabo. I am the social justice coordinator for the American Humanist Association. And background, you mean like religious faith or what do you? you Uh, Whatever you, uh, education, um, upbringing, whatever you want to include into that. Yeah, I mean, I was raised in a very religious with a very religious background, Pentecostal Christianity. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but I mean, it's one of, you know, thousands of <laughs> denominations. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It was basic, virtually everyone in my family is religious. And so I, as usual, when you're a teenager, you don't really, uh, I shouldn't say usual in some cases or in many cases, I didn't, you know, wasn't devout or whatever, but I came, I became born again when I was 18. And so for a few years there, I was a self-described Jesus freak, like in every, every sense that you could imagine. I lived and breathed it from the time I woke up to the time I went to sleep. I was young. I was like 18, 19, 20 years old, leading Bible studies, leading prayers for groups, you know, large groups or whatever. Right. And I actually started getting into, I don't want to say pre, I don't know. I don't remember now. I don't know if I wanted to be a preacher, but I did a couple of speaking engagements, you know? Okay. I don't, I don't want to call it preaching though. Cause I wasn't really trying to become a preacher. It's just, you know, because I had the strong quote unquote conviction of the faith, you know, it was something that I did. So then 
I've always been curious though, right? So, and even as a teenager, I was really interested in things like Greek mythology. So when I got older and when I became really religious, I started to become curious about church history, okay? And so that led me to, that led me to actually read more about uh, church history but from secular accounts, from historians, et cetera. So then that just made me question even more things or right. become more, I should say. And so that led me to read more, not only about church origins and whatnot, but also expand the scope to learn more about other religious traditions and other God beliefs and other cultures dating back to ancient mythology and the ways in which these types of ideas kept on being reproduced, repurposed, and et cetera, things of that nature. Then I started learning more about philosophy. Then I started reading more when it comes to social science. So the cognitive science of religion. And so by that point, it was like, okay, yeah, I, yeah, I can no longer. <laughs> right. So that's basically how that happened. And then over the period, it was a slow deconversion though. So, you know, I want to say I started doing that, what, 21, 22, I would say 22. I started doing that and it took, I don't remember. I want to say two or three years. Okay. Where I was like, yeah, this is absurd. And then after a couple more years, I, I grew more and more outspoken because once you realize, you know, once you become more aware of these certain ideas and how bad they are and how they perpetuate harmful beliefs and behavior within society, I became more and more outspoken against right. religious hegemony. And then that eventually led to me slowly becoming more involved with the, excuse me, more involved with the atheist community, secular community, whatever you want to call it. And so I first, I first became a board member with black non-believers. Okay. And so I started working with them and then eventually I became a regional director with American atheists. And so that was that was an interesting experience, but I learned through that experience as well. And I actually won the 2014, I was awarded the 2014 O'Hare Scholarship for my activism oh, when wow. it comes to separation of church and state and basically being an atheist activist and whatnot. And then I started working with, well, I shouldn't say then, eventually I started working more with CFI's, what is it called? African Americans for Humanism. I started oh, okay. working with, yeah, with that initiative with Debbie Goddard, who works for CFI. And you know, during this time, while I'm engaging in these issues related to social, well, related to religious hegemony and critiquing religious faith and the ways in which it can adversely affect society, I became more and more curious again that term <laughs> about other ways that we as a society are and perpetuate the ways in which we perpetuate certain injustice and form and specific forms of bigotry and prejudice and whatnot right so then i slowly become became started becoming more involved in what people would call social justice uh, issues and speaking out against certain social justice issues related to social justice or social injustice, I should say. <laughs> and so then, you know, my writing started to speak to both religious and social uh, issues. Right. So huh. basically when AJ created their, well, American Humanist Association, when they started their new position as social justice coordinator, I actually didn't know anything about it. I had people once the position became available, contact me and be like, hey, there's this new uh, position that AJ has started. This will work well for you, blah, 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 and everything like that. And so that's basically how I learned of the position. And then I spoke with people here at AJ, interviewed, and 
basically. Matter of fact, be, before that, I actually met someone from a representative from AJ at Secular Social Justice because I was a speaker there and Maggie Ardente, she's also the development director here at AJ. And so she also spoke there. And so I had a chance to speak with her then about the position and what it entails and whatnot. Right. And so then I went from, yeah. Okay. So I guess that kind of brings us to what is social justice? Yeah. So I would say a basic working definition of social justice is that it's the reference to a reference to a fair or just distribution of privileges and opportunities within society, right? And so knowing this, when we discuss social issues or when we discuss issues of social justice or social justice advocacy, we're referring to those seeking this aim. So why, why, why this <laughs> pursuit is important then it, to me, it's self-explanatory, right? Social activism or social justice activism exists and is necessary precisely due to the, you know, the current state of affairs. Right, right. Live in an unfair and unjust society where some folks, some identity groups of people are granted a surplus of privileges and opportunities and others are, uh, and others are afforded a deficit of privileges and opportunities. And so since we are all made up of multiple identities, these issues of advantages and disadvantages intersect and it's complex, but I'll, I'll unpa- unpack that later. I, I assume we'll get that <laughs> yeah, later, but hopefully, I mean, yeah. something that I think is important though, in all these discussions that I don't really think is discussed enough. I've mentioned it before. I know I have, I just can't remember which article I wrote about it. But I want to mention what I consider very important when it comes to this discussion, the point of social justice in general, and what I do specifically, the purpose of critiquing or challenging status quoism, commonly and uh, uncritically accepted beliefs or social norms that are both harmful and sometimes oppressive, the purpose, the purpose of all of that is to cultivate increased critical consciousness. And so that's the thing, though. That's the that's the important part because critical consciousness will lead to introspection, will lead to right. self correction, abandoning oppressive views, and taking action that leads to increased social and political power for marginalized folks. So that's basically the impetus of what I do and why I do it. So critical consciousness is key, though, and so. It's a concept, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it was developed by Paulo Freire. And matter of fact, so the the idea comes from his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And that's actually available online as a okay. PDF. It's free. If you just Google that Pedagogy of the Oppressed, you'll be able to pull that up if you don't want to actually buy it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, critical consciousness is what it is basically entails is, is you're endeavoring towards a deeper understanding of the world and your social position within the social systems that govern society. So it's about how you and others are affected by history, uh, structures, and systems that exist. Okay. So this, I mean, it's, it's really important because when we – how can I, it's like when, when we speak in terms of systems, we're describing mechanics of established social mores, social institutions and social structures. So, and, and, and the relevance of social history and, and how it still plays on the present and how these things impact and influence culture and how culture normalizes and maintains prejudicial messaging and, mainstream narratives, et cetera. So I, this, this is very, this is central to when we're talking about pursuing social justice, we're talking about have, uh, uh, developing and applying that critical conscious lens. So because it allows for analysis of how the past remains settled to the present. And this is something that James Baldwin discussed before. I can't put it in the way he did because he's a genius, but <laughs> you know, he, we have to basically to conceptualize history as some distant thing 
detached from life circumstances or social systems, cultural norms, and the status quo, that's a critical error. And that's something that James Baldwin often discussed. And he's, he can't be more right. I mean, are you familiar with Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow? Uh, yes, actually. I haven't read it yet, but I ha- I do have a copy. <laughs> we do. That actually goes right into what we're discussing here because in her book, right, she thoroughly reveals how the current state of mass incarceration that disproportionately impacts communities of color, it, how it has a direct connection to Jim Crow. And before that, and before that, what was referred to as black codes. And before that, it, how that is also connected to chattel slavery and the ultimate disenfranchisement of Africa. Okay. So talking about that history is saddled to the present. That's what we're talking about. But see, then you also have to remember that a lack of critical consciousness consciousness will lead to incomplete or mistaken assumptions and questions about what and why about the what and why of society. So people who don't consider this important critical consciousness, they'll ask the wrong questions or incomplete questions. Right. So right. If about mass incarceration, right? someone will say, well, what did that person do to get locked up? You know, when we think in terms of systems, social systems, um, that that question doesn't really make sense because instead, for those who recognize social systems and how they're at play, they would instead think in terms of like, hmm, well, systemic conditions of social, economic, and political disenfranchisement produce disproportionate lack of access to adequate resources and opportunity within certain communities. So, I mean, out of, you'll see that there's a more of a tendency for out of the state of desperation and frustration, right? We'll see what is com- referred to as quote unquote crimes of poverty that, that are disproportionately carried out by certain communities. Okay. So in the, I mean, you know, that, and, but then that also leads to alternative means of obtaining wealth. These same communities that we're talking about are routinely locked out of the mainstream economy. That's something that Michelle Alexander also discusses due to those same social, economic, and political deprivations. So that's why you have, you know, you're used to seeing the stereotypical quote unquote drug dealer, right? And and the point is the effects we see don't occur in a vacuum, sans context or pro- provocation. Right. So right. critical is, is interested in seeking out the underlying issues. And it's not like we're trying to point fingers or call people bad, you know, uh, the, when we're talking about social justice, right? So what, what we're saying is that these systems don't operate autonomously, which means that we preserve or contribute to the state of these unjust systems, even if we're unaware. So right. no, this, we can see why this pursuit, this pursuit of social justice is vital. Well, well, I should, it's vital for those who actually care about seeking a more just world. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's an important clarification. <laughs> that's yeah, it's interesting. It's almost like you can draw a line through history and say this is the cause and effect uh, to where we are now. And it's odd to me. Like quite often, we get into these discussions, and people say, "Well, no." marginalization or, or racism was fixed at this at x point <laughs> yeah. it seems really weird yeah i mean it's that's <laughs> that's nonsense for more than one reason but i feel like <laughs> i feel like we'll get into that later <laughs> we'll yeah. so i guess uh as the social justice coordinator for uh the aha you did you experience some pushback from the secular community as to like, Hey, we don't need social, social justice or how does social justice mix with the, this atheist community or the secular community. And when we're talking about secular community, we're talking about atheist and humanist spaces, right? Right. Right. So (laughs) yeah, I suppose it's, it's, and it's so we could, we could seriously talk about this forever. Seriously. (laughs) I have, let, let me ask you this first though. Okay. All right. Because I think that it's more germane to discuss the connection between social justice and humanism. We can talk about overall secular community, but social justice and humanism, right? Right. So how would you define humanism or or what it means to you? 
uh, human humanism to me is uh is kind of the the struggle or the uh, the push towards a a better society for all people <laughs> mm, okay so look <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, but it's not. It's really frustrating. So it's like, I, all right, okay. I know AJ and other humanist groups and organizations, they have their own definitions. You know, we can pull them up. Right. But say the term humanism refers to an outlook on life, an outlook in which someone is determined by their own will to have a positive impact on the world rather than relying on what they imagine to be supernatural influence to guide or inspire their intentions and actions. So given what we know about the humanist philosophy and how I approach life from the humanist stance, humanism is the desire to, to live ethically, right? To honor every individual's humanity. And I would say that this extends to honoring non-human life and to improve the conditions of society since the conditions impact the suffering or well-being of humans. And when we do this, when humanists engage in this pursuit, it's based on human effort that expresses concern, ingenuity, and a regard for scientific advancement, both natural and social science advancement, I should clarify. So what do you think of that definition? I suppose it's, uh, it's more specific almost, right? Like it's, uh, it seems more in depth than my, my little quick definition. I think what you said, though, kind of aligns with what I said. Yeah. yeah. The point of me asking that is because my question would then be for naysayers, and naysayers of social justice would be, if you consider yourself a humanist, how does pursuing social justice not relate to humanism? What this mutilated version of humanism are they adhering to that says, no, I don't think we should challenge or seek to relieve issues of sexism or misogynoir or queer antagonism or racism. Like, what is that? What is it? I want to know. <laughs> I want to know what the definition is. So, uh, so, I mean, when it comes to how it relates to humanist and secular community, social justice, Audre Lorde, okay, womanist, womanist feminist writer, civil rights activist, Audre Lorde, she once said, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. Right. So we have to remember that we don't exist as an undifferentiated category of being. We all possess diverse backgrounds, histories, unique experiences based upon whatever assembly of identity identities we carry uh, with us. Right. So how the white heterosexual male atheist experiences the world will differ from the black heterosexual male a- atheist. Right. And you to repeat that, we could go on forever for the <laughs> South Asian lesbian humanists or the black trans, transgender or non-binary individual who also identifies as atheists. How they exist, how they move within and experience the world will differ from yeah. the typical gender heterosexual male atheist live experience. So despite me and other folks with differing experiences, that also critique and perceive the problems with the many ways religious hegemony adversely affects society are, are these folks, am I, are, and the issues that we face are, that don't directly relate to, um, to, uh, to the separation of church and state and whatnot. Are, are they, are we, is it just to be ignored or placed on the back burner or dismissed as having no relevance due to not being directly related to the, a preoccupation with uh, listing reason 900 million, nine, 9,000, why I'm an atheist in separation of church and state. Like this, this is why I started off by discussing critical consciousness. Right. Critical analysis will provide a capacity to critique both unjust religious and social hierarchies. So and I'm not saying I've achieved some imagined plateau of social consciousness because that's <laughs> You know, I'm still growing and developing my ability to to better perceive and appreciate these issues. So right. what, what I am saying is that I'm able and willing, that's the key, I'm willing to scrutinize harmful attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors that emanate from God beliefs as well as the very same bad ideas, those 
attitudes, those values that support white supremacy or ableism or misogyny. So if the humanists and secular communities are truly about communities, if they're about providing community, if they're about community, then it would make sense that said communities would be more inclusive, especially humanist spaces. Come on, man. Since the bare philosophy <laughs> boasts an interest in being good without God. Right. But I mean, maybe that's just a slogan, though. <laughs> I imagine for some people it is a bit. Uh, <laughs> it makes you wonder, like, where where isn't social justice crossed into uh, humanism? <laughs> exactly. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with Danielle Moscato, but I had an interview with her on The Humanist. And something she said, I don't remember it, but something she said when we were talking, I asked her, what do you see as being the connection between social justice and humanism? And her quote was like, that's something I need to memorize. Like, it it, it really spoke to it. And it's on thehumanist.com. Okay. So, I don't know. It's something that I, it was an interview from like a couple months ago. If you just search thehumanist.com, and you, I guess if you just put in Danielle Moscato, it, the interview should come right up. Okay. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So I guess just to shift gears for a second, uh, is social justice anti-free speech? <laughs> I was, this is, I've always found these kinds of questions bizarre. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Like, I, well, I already define social justice. So I mean... right. Each enthusiast, at least the ones who oppose social justice, they tend to have issues with entitlement. I want to be able to say absolutely any and everything that comes out of their mind, that comes out of their mouth without any critique or reaction. That just, it doesn't make sense for more than one reason. I mean, <laughs> free speech isn't equal to entitlement to speak on all platforms or entitlement to be heard by everyone without social consequences to what is said. The idea of free speech, quote unquote, refers to our government and recognizing the legal edict of freedom of speech right. <laughs> and that the government cannot restrain or penalize you for what you say or not say, barn, you know, obviously certain restrictions, restrictions um, adjudicated by the Supreme Court. This in no way, shape or form grants exemption on a social level from criticism or shame or consequences arising from whatever happens to fall out of your mouth. Right. So further when discussing social justice, and this might be, I guess a minor digression, I'm not sure, but we again must consider what I said about critical consciousness. Those firmly set against social justice may not want to hear this and that's okay. But for those who are more curious and for those that may have doubts or questions about the things we take for granted on a daily basis. I would say this regarding speak, right? Social justice, when in a more just world where everyone includes both action taking and conversations that center social justice obje objectives. So I've, I've, I've observed a lot of folks who take issue of what they regard as being censored because those who appreciate the pursuit of Social justice advocate for language that decenters oppressive standards that many right. observe what unwittingly or they do it maliciously because they're assholes. <laughs> this means that there's a push to develop a vocabulary that permits us to have more insightful conversations. If we attempt to incite action using inaccurate or obsolete vocabularies, and typically this refers to definitions of the world set forth by those in positions of power then our consciousness of the problems at hand will remain shallow. So, and Josette Souza, she wrote something, uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago. She wrote something that still, uh, something that I still think about. She's, she basically said, cries of censorship within this context is, well, I'm paraphrasing her because I don't remember what she said. Okay. Specific censorship within this context is typically the result of falsely equating not being allowed to move through the world uncriticized or unchallenged right. with a government preventing them from expressing their charming views in public. And I mean, it's, it's true. This is the reactive bellow of insular entitlement. It's hard for me to take anyone serious who's convinced the constitution's protections of free speech against government censorship 
and retaliation magically includes safeguard, a safeguard against non-government limitations or social consequences to, or whatever odious nonsense they spew that can or, or does harm or threaten the existence of others. So, I mean, I don't know if that, really, <laughs> but how I feel about that. Yeah. It's interesting. Like people almost think that, uh, being told on Facebook that you can't say something or that you shouldn't say something is equivalent to, uh, censorship in some way. And I, I, I think that that's been pretty thoroughly debunked by m- many people, but it still keeps popping up. I've had people come onto my page, onto my personal space and cry that I'm censoring them when I tell them that they can't say certain shit on my own page. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Like blocking mm-hmm. somebody is censoring them in some way. Yeah. And see, you know what? I, me personally, I rarely block someone and I do this because if I unfriend someone or they unfriend me, they're no longer allowed to comment. So I can keep on talking and they have to, they'll, cause you know, there's certain types that'll just keep on going back to see the conversation, but they can't respond. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and then also they'll then try to get into my inbox, but then because they're no longer friends, it goes to the message request thing right. or whatever. And I'll, I'll just let it sit there. And I know they get mad. <laughs> I, think, yeah. I, I really, I don't even remember the last time I blocked somebody. Yeah. I don't block people very often. It's it, it, uh, unless they can demonstrate like, that they just can't think about what we're discussing. <laughs> like, I, I ended up blocking some people during the election because there was some people who came on and go, Oh, killery and <laughs> that yeah. kind of stuff. But, so I guess mm. in a similar vein, do you think that uh, pro social justice people uh, occasionally use terms like racist or sexist to shut down the conversation or to stop people from discussing things? I would say, <laughs> let's say anyone who believes this doesn't understand the terms racist or sexist. That's what I would say. I, the The most common mistake people make when talking about the complex issues like sexism and racism is to think of their existence, the existence of these um, forms of social oppression, is to think of their existence as a problem of personal prejudices and individual acts of discrimination. Right. They don't see or they refuse to see these things as a system, like we've talked about in the beginning, right. as a system of, of interlocking, reinforcing oppressive institutions. And we're talking about political, economic, legal, social, cultural, educational. These and other oppressive systems are present in all of our social institutions. As a system, things like heterosexism or white supremacy or sexism and so on, so on, so on, affects every aspect of life in a country. So, again, this is why I started out discussing basic stuff like critical consciousness and why it's important. Because by not understanding that these issues are systemic, we guarantee that it'll continue. And we'll say ignorant stuff like sexism, right? For example, sexism. Sexual harassment and sexual violence due to male entitlement is often by men reimagined as merely the case of a quote, few bad guys, unquote, instead of understanding this type of behavior is uh, pervasive, that is normalized, encouraged, and requires all around us all of the time. And I just wrote an article last week discussing this in response to the San Bernardino murder suicide. Yeah. And not even a week later, we have the repugnant, this, that Cleveland Facebook killer who murdered an unarmed elderly man. Why? Due to being rejected. Right. You know, these things happen all of the time. Something else I highlight in my article when I was talking about the San Bernard, San Bernardino murder suicide is how often abuse and deadly violence occurs due to women or femmes telling a man no. Right, so, yeah. An- another example can relate to racism. So racist police behavior is often reduced to a few few bad apples uh, right. who need to be removed instead of realizing these practices is part of a system and that they can be found in police departments all across the United States. And that's not calling every single individual police officer a bad person. You see, people 
they, it's hard. These people speak of, oh, they need you want it, they want to be, they claim to be objective and they claim to observe nuance, but they can't tell the demarcation between what I'm talking about. You see what I'm saying though, right? <laughs> and so there's a preponderance of empirical evidence that highlights this fact that these type of issues are happening everywhere, all across the United States and all of the police departments. It's an issue. It's a, it's a systemic issue. So only in the mind of someone who upholds status quoism that normalizes abusive oppress- or, or oppressive language would consider it a bad thing that these things are called out or that they're challenged whenever these ideas or attitudes are expressed in discussion. Right. Quite often in these discussions, I, I find, like, for example, the uh, uh, disproportionate, I guess, killing of black people uh, by police, uh, I get, I get uh, statistical responses like, oh, well, uh, look at the number of murders committed by black people and look at the number of crimes committed by black people. I, I wonder, do we get bogged down in sort of misleading statistics sometimes in this, these things? I would say that that can be the case sometimes too, yes. And usually though, when we're talking about these things, when we're talking about the ways in which certain communities, particularly in this instance, communities of color, are disproportionately the victim of uh, police brutality and murder. Because we're not talking just about how we are continuously murdered, but also continually uh, on the we continually are abused and mistreated. I was going to say something. I totally lost my train of thought because I started while I was sitting there talking, I was sitting there thinking about experiences that I had. And so basically it, it's very, it's it, for, this is a subject that can be very infuriating for certain people of color and black right. folks, because we know what we know, right? We know how, <laughs> There are certain situations where we've been in where we know good and damn well if it were a white pe- person, it would not have happened that way. You right. can talk about it goes be it goes beyond just, oh well, look at it. We can talk about statistics, and I have statistics to back up what I'm saying, but further than that, we can look at specific instances where you look at how a person was treated, yeah, and how they met demise. And you have to wonder, do they even consider us human? And you know. Even if they don't want to admit it, the people who are against social justice or who want to talk about black on black crime, and I can talk about that all day too. And <laughs> right. I actually wrote something. I keep on going to digression after digression, but I also wrote something titled Why the Appeal to All Lives Matter is Bunk. I wrote that. It's on Patheos. If you look that up, you'll find that. And I think I also, what is that? No, 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 no. The article I'm talking about is why white America demonizes Black Lives Matter. Oh, yeah, I, wrote I remember that. reading that, yeah. I think in there I discussed the issue of trying to digress from that spe- specific issue of talking about black-on-black crime, and I, I speak to that. But so we're talking about instances in which people are treated differently. Right. And that's what we're down to and how we're uh, dehumanized. And so... And also, for, further, we can talk about the ways in which we're de- dehumanized. Like Tamir Rice, the way he was murdered right. 12 years, and he was perceived as being an adult and, and, and a, as a threat. The police shot that little boy be, uh, within seconds. I want to say two seconds. I can't remember. But you can see the, the footage. Yeah. Before the police car even came to a complete stop, that man killed that boy. About, you know, it. come on, man. <laughs> and so... I mean, seriously, think think about instances like that. There's plenty of them. But also, more than that, when people want to say that we're being, quote, unquote, divisive when we talk about issues like this, and we all, you also have to remember, these, and see, this also talks about media, too. This also, media comes into play. Right. When I remember where, but that one, I can't say boy, he was 18 years old. He was a white guy. He was, he, he I can't remember his name. I have to pull him up. But he got murdered unjustly by the police. And he came out his truck and he started going towards the cop and they just shot him like eight times. Right. And what isn't often reported in the media and what you don't see is Black Lives Matter rally for that boy all across the nation. It's something I talked about on social media. Everybody within the Black Lives Matter movement discussed that because it was tragic and it was horrific and it was wrong. 
So right. when we're talking about the ways in which people are disproportionately affected and black people are dispro- disproportionately affected by uh, police brutality, et cetera, and so are indigenous folks. And now they are actually worse <laughs> when, than, when, when, than as compared to black people. But anyway, when people say that we're being divisive, I mean, they it, media also plays a part as well. I, I, I definitely would agree with that when some people try to make that argument. So I guess uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit. Like people often say that the left is what's keeping people separated by these uh, different identities like race or gender or sexuality. Um, so I wonder what, uh, what do you think of that idea? Like, are, is it the left's fault that these people, that everybody's being divided? This, I would say, connects to the problem we see within humanist spaces and those who claim to be humanists that regards initiatives that critique specific bigotries and prejudices as being, quote unquote, divisive, as I just said. This is intellectual malpractice. And this also goes well beyond the simplistic reference to the left, as there are many folks on the left spectrum that disregard the importance of addressing social injustice. Right. And that also go on to criticize the importance of uh, seeking uh, or, or, or pursuing issues related to race, gender, and sexuality, which is part of the reason, which is why basically I said that this is connects directly to what I was talking about with humanist spaces, because why those within humanist spaces are you know, people you would consider as being a part of the left. And they deserve as much criticism as those on the right. So, I mean, our our nation has always <laughs> enforced complex systems of segregation that marginalizes groups of people based on class, gender, race, sex, sexual orientation, etc. Right. Com- comprehensive disenfranchisement continues to target women and femmes, people of color, and folks within the LGBTQ communities in a way that cannot be logically reconciled with fantasies of a just world. I mean, tell me, all right, tell me if you heard this before. We are all Africans. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can I can picture the the the, the t shirts now. All lives <laughs> matter. We're all this together. We're all one race, the human race. Right. Whoa. Another one I hear a lot. Why can't you just can recognize that we're that we're all just Homo sapiens? These things. This speaks <laughs> to the overall issue in her book. This is something I always think about. It, I highly suggest reading this book. In her book, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. It's short, too. It's like 90 pages, 100 pages. Okay. Uh, Angela Davis, civil rights icon. She critiqued what she called, what she referred to as the tyranny of the universal. So universalist claims or offering generalities in reaction to critiques of specific issues of privilege power dynamics is an act of avoidance. Right. These kinds of Universal proclamations necessarily bolster systems of oppression since they deny its its existence. You know, any critical engagement with fill in the blank social oppression requires us to understand the tyranny of the universal. So, more to the point, for most of our history, the category human has not embraced indigenous people, black people, people of color non-black people of color. And remember what I said before about history, past is prologue in more ways than one. So history is an indelible part of the present. We are embodiments of history. So then such claims that obscure the complex nature of the way oppressive systems operate and and don't adequately represent reality and how they, how some are clearly treated differently than others are how some people are treated differently than others based on identity. The point is that just because you profess to stand in unity or overall just Africans, I mean, it doesn't magically abolish the underlying policies that inform the intricacies, the intricacies of our ideation and movements through the world. Right. And matter of fact, matter of fact, another quote by Audre Lorde, I think sums up this issue. I don't want, she said, it is not our differences that divide us. It's our inability to accept, recognize, and celebrate those differences. So the idea that 
quote unquote unity requires erasure of specific identity based issues for the sake of a broader cause is a fiction usually sold by those exempt from the lived struggles they prefer to diminish. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Yeah. I think I, I think I'm understanding where you're coming from. It's like, uh, uh, whiteness isn't an identity. So we just want to, uh, say everybody should be part of the group we're in type thing. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, have you, this is kind of a digression, but it actually speaks to that. And this overall uh, discussion, have you ever seen, I am not your Negro. I have not. I I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it yet. You have to see it. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, it is so powerful. It was very powerful. It is I I want to recommend that to everyone. I want to put screenings of it everywhere. Everyone right. needs to see that. It's one of those things that can open a person's eyes. Yes. I mean, and cuz like James Baldwin is just he was a genius. He was a genius. And the way he was able to use words to inspire and us to not only into action, but inspires us to think more critically about ourselves and our place in the world, both black and white and beyond. So, and that, and when I was in the theater, that, that was the first time to my recollection, that was the first time people I'm talking about, of course, every spotless bill I'm talking about, I had a date and she came late. We, <laughs> She and she wasn't able to sit with me. Like people were standing, people were standing up watching. It was, it was amazing. It was an amazing experience. So I guess we kind of touched on it a few times, like this idea of identity politics. (laughs) (laughs) So what, what is identity politics and what are the arguments against it that are like, how do people consider this a a negative thing? Well, (laughs) there, I, it's both simple and it's complex, to be honest. And I would, something I, I know I keep on recommending stuff, but one last time, I think, <laughs> I recommend so it's a really quick read by Ajioma Aluo. And I know that name might be a nightmare for you, so I'll send it to you. <laughs> Sounds but good. She wrote an article titled, Thank God for Identity Politics. Now, she's an atheist, so the title is meant to be sarcastic. And it did get those who don't get why emphasizing issues that relate to specific identity issues are, are important. So, I mean, the phrase identity politics, okay. In recent times, it's, it's become an easy access punching bag, it seems. Even though those who use it as such, they use it as a blanket term that invokes a variety of vague or cherry-picked ideas of political failing. And this is an amazing co- convenience, right? We do well to remember that there's no foe easier to, to defeat than one construed from ambiguity. Since <laughs> the, the shortcomings are whatever you project them to be, whatever you imagine them to be. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, how would you define identity politics? No, matter of fact, matter of fact, how would you think naysayers define identity politics? I think, I think naysayers define identity politics as... Uh, a bunch of different groups all just vying for the most attention and the, the most uh, uh, advantages from based on perceived uh, what they would consider quote unquote perceived uh, disadvantages or marginalization. Cause quite often these foes of identity politics, they, they don't think that marginalization or uh, is a real thing or that it, <laughs> they figure everybody's already got this equality that ha- we're looking for. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is, this is what I've seen in my observation of people who use this as a pejorative, uh, many who trivialize or disparage identity politics usually do so out of, how would I, unwitting out of an unwitting or a willful allegiance to the idea of individual individualism as well as indistinct ideas of what identity means and its relation to social grouping. Right. Yeah. So, actually, now that you mentioned that I did watch a Sargon of Akkad video where he specifically said like that it, uh, identity politics eliminates the individual in favor of the group. That speaks perfectly to what I'm about to say <laughs> because I've seen it. I've seen it so many times. I've seen it so many times and it's almost always people who have, 
no comprehension of philosophy and the epistemic uh, relevance of identity that would say ignorant stuff like that. So, but an added layer of antagonism emanates from those comfortable within their relative status in society and find no merit in addressing social issues that don't negatively affect their life. Also, also, I've also seen those who adopt a Marxist or class-based worldview, they tend to, uh, to regard identity politics as a mere smokescreen to class consciousness. Right, right. And it, it, the, all of these factors, whether it be unawareness, ignorance, social luxury of apathy, right? And it's all about class conflation. All of those things mingle together in many cases, and they create mistaken conclusions about matters that these types of people uh, that, that they haven't begun to appropriately grasp. Right. It's, Something. Yeah. <laughs> no, what were you going to say? Well, I was just, I was thinking, because I have heard quite a few people say like that they think these are economic issues. They aren't racial issues or gender issues. Exactly. See, I, I'm telling you, I've seen this so many times <laughs> before. And so I've heard that argument many times before. And one person in particular, but I'm not going to call him out now because I think I'm going to write an article about it. It's I, they said this at a conference, but I'm gonna break that down later. But yeah. so we we're talking about individualism, right? Where that idea from Sar, whatever his name is, that that emphasizes the discourse of individualism, which is right. a recurring reasoning used to devalue the consequence of social identity. And it's when when it when it comes to the discourse of individualism, what it does is it robs those who put stock in it, it robs them of awareness vital for discerning our social reality. It hinders our capacity to accept that life experiences are greatly influenced by such things as sexuality, by race, gender, and class. And so on. continue with that. And, oh, so I did lie. There is another thing. Um, when we're talking about the discourse of individualism, I refer to it as such because of a research paper that I read by Robin D'Angelo, and it's, it's titled, Why Can't We All Just Be Individuals? And it specifically talks about this. Okay. And so hey, anyone's interested, you and whoever else interested in, of a comprehensive breakdown of what the discourse of individualism entails and why these ideas are flawed when it comes to, oh, just be an individual, then that's the article you want to check out. Now, she focuses basically on when she defines it and she articulates it, she's using it to critique issues related to race and racism, but the critique can also be applied more generally to social oppression. And when we're talking about social identity. So, but I mean, the, the discourse of individualism is it's basically a set of ideas and narratives that create or reinforce uh, the belief that, all of us are unique individuals and that our group memberships, whether gender, race, whatever, that all of that is not important or relevant when it comes to life opportunities and privileges. That's right. basically what the dis individualism means. So in order to believe this damnable lie, right. you have to discount social and historical context that creates the present state of affairs, like I already spoke about. Right. You also have to re reject a big picture, a, a macro analysis of the institutional and structural dimensions of social life. And you'd have to deny the, the relevance of collective solo, solas, uh, socialization and the power of dominant culture. So that includes media, education, religion, et cetera. And how these influences necessarily shape our perspectives and ideology. And this uh, illusion would have us believe we exist outside of socialization and so, I mean, <laughs> folks, marginalized groups usually don't have the luxury of indulging this oppressive fiction. You don't have time. Right. Okay. Yeah. And all, and all that doesn't mean, even begin to scratch the surface because I, I'm, I think I just said it a couple minutes ago. I'm willing to argue that most that complain about identity politics don't even have a proper or epistemic understanding of what identity even means. Right. When you talk about the, we're referring to non-arbitrary descriptors referring to objective and causally significant features of a shared reality. They're conditional. They're, they're conditional products 
of social interaction and social institutions. And, the, and identity, it's, it's also subject to occupying particular locations within time, social space, and historical communities. Again, we're talking about history again, right? How we're, we are present. I mean, how we are history, I should say. <clears throat> and something that always bugs me is those who don't know what they're talking about <laughs> is, is they try to focus on, um, they, they say that identity-based issues, that it's an attempt to homogenize groups, marginalized groups. And that makes no sense because to share an identity with others is to share in only one facet of a multifaceted reality. Right. There is no prediction between identifying with specific social groups and being a complex, unique individual. Yeah, you know, so that it, there's it's conflation of the term identity anyway. When identity when discussing common identity, separate from individual identity, because there's actually two different uh, meanings to the word, we're describing what's imposed on us by an established history of, of social stratification, standards, controlling images and stereotypes. We could go on down the line. The realness of identities, it's subject to uh, time, space, history. And um, identity group experiences fundamentally shape our, shape our lives, our possibilities, our perceptions, ambitions, and the kind of an inquiry we engage in. So right. to, affirm we have, uh, a, a, to affirm we have an identity or to state that we're part of a particular identity group is to simply agree we have a location in social space. And so when we're talking about identity politics then, Identity politics recognizes that social categories of identity often reasonably and effectively name specific social locations from which individuals happen to engage in political judgment, among other things. So, I mean, you're familiar with the term closed mouths don't get fed, right? You heard of that? I have heard that. Well, that's how I like to relate it, uh, relate the efficacy of identity politics because identity politics is a means of seeking and demanding increased self-determination and social power, currently not distributed in an equal or just manner. But, you know, in order to realize that, that takes what? Critical consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I guess we're, we're coming up on an hour of your time here. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say kind of in closing? Like in a, anything um... we didn't touch on that you kind of wanted to touch on? I, really, th these are the type of questions <laughs> that we could continue talking about for like hours. Right. And, yeah. But discussed and written about time and time again. And actually, I have something that will be published in the Institute for Humanist Studies. They they're publishing an anthology titled "Studies in Atheism and Humanism." It'll be out in fall. Where I specifically. I go into detail. I'm talking about <laughs> that sucker is like 25 pages long nice. well, when I wrote it in work, <laughs> but it's, 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 it'll be included in the anthology and it's discussing identity, identity politics and the discourse of individualism. Well, I should say more precisely sensible identity politics. And so I make that demarcation in the paper. Okay. But that's something that, can't wait till that's out there. But I mean, no, I'm, other than that, those who are interested in the work that I do and the work that AJ is doing, I would just say check out American Humanist Association and thehumanist.com. Yeah, you have articles kind of all over the place. Uh, anything, any kind of one spot where we could find most of your stuff? I would say check out the Huffington Post because I only have two things there, but it's the one that I just talked about the San Bernardino issue when we're talking about male entitlement, that article, and then the critique of Sam Harris when he was sitting there trying to talk about race and racism and he didn't know what he was talking about. Right. And so that's on there. I think that actually speaks to some of the issues that we we're discussing. But yeah, that that and then the humanist.com, I have articles on there, and then everyday feminism, I have articles on there. And like we said before, I was I published what was it? Uh, why white America demonizes Black Lives Matter? Oh. That is there. Okay. That that yeah, that's from there. And then also, I have another article that's discussing Black atheism. What that means. That's also on 
everyday feminism. So cool, cool. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, it took us a lot of time, a lot of tries to get here, but I really appreciate it. I apologize for that. No, no worries. It's I, I really, uh, I'm glad that I we got things lined up to get you on. Me too. Well, thanks again mm-hmm. very much, and uh, I hope you have a good one. All right, you too. I'll talk to you later. So that's my interview with Sincere Carabo. I thought it was very educational. I don't have any real points of contention with what he said. He also provided a few resources for information, and I actually had time this week to check out the things he mentioned, so all those links will be in my show notes on the Spreaker page. Really, listening to Sincere answer my questions and respond to the concerns that we managed to have time for was enlightening, to say the least. I think he really took down most of the arguments against identity politics, and he explained why humanism and social justice are linked in a way that makes perfect sense to me. Other than that, I don't really have anything to say about the interview. I think it it compares nicely with the discussion I had with Edwin in la- the last episode. And between the two of them, I I find that both of these interviews have been really enlightening for somebody who's spent a lot of time like trying to learn as much I, as I can about social justice and they really addressed some of the concerns that I've heard from people who are anti-social justice. So I guess that's all I'll say there. You can find some of Sincere's work at patheos.com slash blogs slash notes from an apostate. He has articles on the establishment, everyday feminism, Huffington post and the humanist.com and probably a million other places because his work seems to be everywhere. I'll try to post as many links to his writing as I can in the show notes. There won't be an episode out next Thursday because I'm changing my format. I'll be working on editing for my interview with Ed Smith from the Wayward Atheists podcast. And as I edit, I'll be taking notes where I disagree, assuming I didn't address the points in the discussion. And then I'll be sending a copy of my notes to Ed so that he can rebut my concerns. And then those concerns and rebuttals will be spliced into the show where appropriate. This should help with any concerns about the fairness of the podcast, and it cuts back on the after-interview commentary. Hopefully it works out and everybody enjoys the new format and thinks that it's fair. It's just going to take a touch more work and a touch more uh, time. You can find more of these episodes at Spreaker.com slash show slash The Hardcore Skeptic Examines, and you can find my show notes there as well. You can find me on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and just about anywhere else you find podcasts. Make sure to follow me on Twitter at Hardcore Skeptic and like my page on Facebook, facebook.com slash Hardcore Skeptic. If you want to support my work, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash Hardcore Skeptic. Remember to check out my other shows, The Brainstorm Podcast and Positively Skeptical. You can find Brainstorm at thebrainstormpodcast.com and brainstormblog.net. And Positively Skeptical will be on available on Spreaker very soon. Thanks again for listening, and remember, the truth matters. Reach out.